everybody to a special edition of the Time and Space podcast. It's just me and the big guy tonight. Yeah. Uh, we we gave Wayne the night off. We gave Sean the night off. And, and as soon as we did, we realized we really needed to do a show tonight because the NCAA tournament starts on Saturday. <laughs> so uh, we're doing a super secret episode tonight that will be released tomorrow. It's the quickest turnaround that we've ever done it. Um, so Wayne is going to do a lot of work to, tomorrow, uh, but, but but we are going to release it tomorrow Wayne just in be time. All night long. So. Wayne, Wayne will be up very, very late and up very, very early to make sure that this thing <laughs> kicks off tomorrow. Um, our special NCAA tournament edition of the Time and Space podcast, what we might call a mini mini sode. Um, mm. Without segment, Sean, it's a little weird, but we're going to try and do the best we can. And we, you know, we're going to talk some lacrosse. That's what we're going to do. That's what we're going to do. And that's, uh, that's what we did about two hours ago on our rides home from work. And (laughs) we're going to do it again. So, um, we're going to start by, first of all, I just want to, I want to check in with you. How you, how, how was your week? Week is great. I've had a couple great practices with our middle school team. Um, we love to do something at the end of practice called shout outs. And it was something that um, I by no means made it up. Um, got it from another one of our coaches at school. Um, give the guys opportunities to acknowledge um, something positive in each other. So at the end of practice, I open it up, say who's got a shout out. And so they raise their hand and and it's been really cool to see how into it they get. And the best part is, is they're not just like, Oh, he scored a goal and that was cool. Our guys are, are talking about other players efforts and these are seventh and eighth grade boys. So to see them call each other out for positive effort for trying hard, right? When middle school, you never know if trying hard is going to be a good thing or if it's going to be something that that kids really don't think is cool. Um, but they are, if they're open to it, some of them have been playing lacrosse for a long time. Some have been playing lacrosse for like four weeks since we started. Um, a couple of these kids are walking around campus with their sticks over their shoulders, like proud as can be. And three weeks ago, I was teaching them how to pass and catch. So it's really cool, uh, cool vibe right now with the team. And it's, it's also cool because we don't have any games. We're, uh, <laughs> we're still in that, uh, that COVID hangover season right now. And uh, no games on the schedule, just strictly practice. Um, we introduced some four-line passing today, actually. Oh, so one hello. of the things that I like to do is uh, I like to bring in old passing drills that we did at NAS and uh, that they probably still do at NAS. So we did some four-corner passing. We did four-man two-ball. We've done that twice, actually. Wow. Uh, we, uh, yeah, today we, we, re- we talked about rolling away. And how to how to roll yeah. away and change your hands. Late hands, <laughs> late hands. Hold on, hold on to them. Uh, we call we call four line passing around the horn at Henhud. Okay. Uh, so okay. yep, we're still doing it. Um, I, I and I want to say too about the shout outs. What an awesome practice in communication. An awesome practice in communication. Positive communication. I love it. Um, shout out to Coach Kayla, who Francis told me. Um, <laughs> Francis told me who uh, kind of gave him the idea, and I think we're going to use that idea too. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. Um, Caleb, big time friend of the podcast, huge friend of the podcast. <laughs> we're going to get her on here sometime soon. We are, we are, we owe her, uh, we owe her some time on this. Um, but huge shout out to Kayla, and um, huge shout out to you for implementing it with your team. It's awesome. Hey, it's a uh, anybody who's listening, who's a coach, especially of uh, young men specifically. I mean, for everybody, but certainly young men, you know, give them an opportunity to uh, to speak in front of each other, to share about each other. Um, You may have to sort of shape and mold how it goes uh, initially. But I think if you give the players the opportunity to uh, to talk positive, positively about one another, hopefully that carries over when they leave the field. I'm going to piggyback on that. So this week, um, our team had uh, the first pasta dinner of the season. Mm-hmm. So something very traditional with with our team um, in the past probably 15 years, pasta dinners have been like a big bonding exercise that they obviously missed out on last year and haven't had an opportunity to really do this year. So 
one of the families on our team hosted a pasta dinner the uh, last night, and it's amazing how well we practiced afterward. And I, I don't know, I don't know that we've ever had a pasta dinner before a practice. So uh, our head coach, Coach Lapore, another great friend of the podcast, um, another person who I think would love to be on the podcast, hasn't earned it yet. Um, <laughs> he he moved some things around and found time to really give these guys a chance to bond with each other outside of the lacrosse field and outside of their academic life. And it really was uh, a great thing. And you could see it um, at practice. They were excited. They were happy. They all had new nicknames for each other, which I was really excited about. Um, it just, it gave us a little bit of social normalcy that we haven't had in a long time. And I think it really went a long way. Uh, one of our, our guys who also is an avid listener of the pod, he, I asked him how it was, and he is very honest and super excitable, uh, just a, a fun guy. Um, and he said, I got to be honest with you, coach. I think that was the best thing that's happened to this team so far this season, having a pasta dinner. So just when you think that lacrosse is really the only thing that makes lacrosse lacrosse, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, I want Just when you think people don't eat regular pasta anymore. Right. They do. <laughs> you hear that, California? People eat regular pasta. Gluten full. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny. I, I've heard uh I heard from a really great basketball analyst, Bill Simmons, right? I was listening to his podcast at one point and he said his book is called The Secret of Basketball. And the big secret is that it's not about basketball, right? And I, I, I feel like that translates to really all sports. The big secret in lacrosse is it's not about lacrosse. It's not about the sport. It's about uh, the bonds you build and the memories you make and how close you can get with your teammates. And then all the lacrosse stuff kind of falls into place. And um, I really do believe that and it was shown times 10 in our practice the other day and in a, a really high quality win today. Um, so we were excited about that, but um, sounds like we had a good week in lacrosse. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. We'll take it. We'll sun's take out, it. Sun's out. Let's go. That's right. Is so, the sun out where you are in New York? I don't, I, I said that like I know, but it, it was quite warm today. Thank you for asking. <laughs> um, it was, it was quite warm. So I was excited uh, to be out in the sun, short sleeve hoodie, uh, oh, okay. tie dye legend hat on okay. the sideline. We're just trying to keep it casual, have just ourselves a good time. Have our Let's get into this uh, NCAA bracket. Let's talk yeah, about it. All, all up in it. All in every section of that first round. That's where we want to be right now. I just want to preface this conversation by letting everybody know that we know what we know about the 16 teams in the bracket. And even more importantly, we don't know what we don't know about the 16 teams in the bracket. So <laughs> while this is a bracketology breakdown, um, by no means are we masters of the, uh, the universe when it comes to all this. So we're going to be making some educated observations. Um, if you disagree, you're probably rightfully disagreeing. So. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I'm gonna uh, also say that, um, you know, that's the beauty of the NCAA tournament. <laughs> you could say whatever you want, and we can all enjoy watching it. Um, um, first matchup: UNC and Monmouth. UNC Monmouth. I'm gonna be honest. Haven't seen Monmouth play this year. Haven't seen them play. Um, actually really looking forward to that's one of the great things about the tournament is that hopefully we get to catch a couple teams that we haven't seen throughout the year um i do um want to give a shout out to uh bryce wasserman who is a monmouth alum who is now a professional lacrosse player and a product of dallas texas um what does that have to do okay. with you in monmouth nothing other than i just wanted to shout out a guy who came from my hometown <laughs> But I, um, I think, you know, for any team that's outside of that top 10, top 11 bubble, um, UNC is going to be a tough matchup. Um, they are a super high powered, 
team and it's not even just in one place you know it's uh chris gray is obviously one of the uh one of the towards on hopefuls and they've got a uh, very solid goaltender they've got a solid defense i think they have two phenomenal face-off guys um that really push the pace of the game um in a very athletic way so uh it seems like unc is firing on uh many cylinders here um you know beating duke in order to share a piece of that acc championship so um you know i'm looking for them to really handle their business in the first round i think you're in good company there um i also haven't seen monmouth play this season um Anytime I have seen them, though, in the past five years, I'm always impressed. I, I feel like they play a really scrappy and um, tough, well-coached, organized brand of lacrosse, um, which is also something you say about a team that you don't see a lot, right? That's <laughs> If I'm being honest, you know, if I, I haven't seen them a lot, so I haven't seen enough of them to really make a, a more educated comment than that because that's what I, I find to be true about them. Um, with that being said, you know, UNC is really in a, in a class of four teams. Yeah. So Monmouth will have to play probably their most perfect game. Um, and what that would hopefully do, if you're a Monmouth fan, is make UNC make, play one of their most imperfect games. So if you get both of those things, that's a recipe for an upset. Um, we're not really a hot take pod. We're more of like a call it how we see it pod. Um, in our bracket challenge of 20 people that we know, I don't have anyone that picked Monmouth. However, beauty of the NCAA tournament. It wouldn't okay. be uh, it wouldn't be like groundbreaking if there was a uh, upset here or anywhere. And for the sake of the game and the sport, we want Monmouth to play a great game. We sure you know, do. That's it. That's always the case. Um, you know, as I think as lacrosse enthusiasts, we more than anybody just want to see a great game. hundred uh, percent. Even if it's our favorite team playing, we want to see a great game. So looking right. forward to it. And the beauty of the division one tournament is we don't really have a favorite team. So we want everyone to, to play well. <laughs> um, let's go to the next matchup on the board, which would be Lehigh. Lehigh. Are we going in how it's how it's laid out there or the number two team? How it's laid out. So okay. the next one we have is Lehigh and Rutgers. Ooh, Lehigh Rutgers. This was a tough choice for me. How did you feel going into this one? This was a tough choice for me too. Um, I wouldn't be surprised either way on this one. You have two really quality teams that have had really, really strong seasons. Um, teams that have taken advantage of this season, I think. Um, in a positive way, uh, Rutgers has a few transfers. Their attack is maybe the, I'll say the most seasoned attack maybe ever in college lacrosse. And by seasoned, I mean older. They are um, in their uh, most, I think all three of them are in their mid 20s, which is not common for uh, NCAA lacrosse. I think that uh, it, this is an interesting matchup. And this may be, this may be one of the better games. Um, as far as being evenly matched, you know, both Rutgers and probably more so Lehigh has really been knocking on the door the last few years. And, uh, you know, Kevin Cassis, who was a, a, a great midfielder at Duke um, sort of while we were coming through um, and Brian Brecht have really been, you know, grinding it out at these programs and really putting the time in and, and building something sustainable. So I'm just excited to see this matchup. It's kind of sad that, you know, one of these teams is going to have to go home right now, yeah. but um, I think this is a, a battle of two teams that are really trying to solidify themselves as perennial top 10 contenders um, in division one lacrosse. And I think there's a lot of pride on the line. There's a lot of excitement. Um, I would look for it to be a little sloppy out of the gate um, just because those that energy is running high. Um, but uh, but looking forward to this matchup and uh, and seeing one of these teams get into that second round. And uh, and once you get in there, you know, that confidence starts flying high and who knows what can happen. A hundred percent. And I would also say, again, because of conferences, I saw Rutgers way more than I was able to see Lehigh. 
I, I Lehigh does not have nearly as much television um, exposure. So with that being said, while I may think Rutgers has a slight advantage, if there is any, I don't know enough about Lehigh to say that they don't have an advantage. I think so. you could argue that the Big Ten is uh, probably stronger overall than the Patriot League, uh, Rutgers being in the Big Ten, Lehigh being in the Patriot League. Um, you know, so Rutgers may on paper be more battle tested. Um you know, and, and what was what people were calling was a pretty weak. Um, I think I've said it was kind of a weaker Big Ten conference. But, you know, at the end, you see Johns Hopkins giving uh, Maryland all that they can handle um, in that championship game. So, um, you know, it was a short season. It was a wonky year. You we might see teams really hitting their stride here in the NCAA tournament, you know, this might be the jump off point for a couple teams. So we may see something different than we've seen before out of some of these guys. Yeah, absolutely. Our next matchup is going to be, and I know you said this one is this past <laughs> last one, Lehigh Rutgers was, could be a tight one in terms of just the matchup, but Georgetown and Syracuse, you might be able to say the same thing. I think you could. I want to, I would love to hear your take coach. Oh man, this, I find this to be in our bracket challenge. There are a few games that are really going to determine who the winner is. And by the winner, I don't mean the winner of the NCAA tournament. I mean, the winner of the, uh, the bracket challenge that we're having. Um, this is one of the more disputed games um, between who thinks who should win. I do think if you like Syracuse, you don't care what Georgetown has. You're picking Syracuse. Um, if you've paid attention a little bit to Georgetown this year, you know that they are dangerous and they are a much different Georgetown team than we've seen in the past five years, I would say. Um, now granted, I think Syracuse might be a little bit different too. What I'm most interested in is seeing how Syracuse has handled a very turbulent ending to their season. Oh, absolutely. When, and when you look at Georgetown and, and first of all, you know, Kevin Warren, has proven now in the last few years that like his team is here and they're not just here, you know, peeking over the fence. They are here. They, uh, they've beaten Denver in their conference tournament now twice, I think in the last three years. Um, and they've been around, you know, when you look at their schedule, I'm seeing a lot of Villanova. I'm seeing St. John's, um, I'm seeing Providence, um, you know, so really, Credit them for getting the win over Denver. Denver seems to be the strongest team that they've played. Now, Georgetown is dangerous, dangerous, dangerous. And I think they have a ton of confidence. When I watch these guys play, at least in the last couple of weeks, they play with a ton of confidence. And that's what you said about Syracuse. How do they embrace this opportunity in the tournament coming off of losing, uh, you know, Chase Scanlon, um, at least from the playing field and with all the allegations that are going on, things like that. Um, you know, mentally, these guys are uh, are young, right? They're, yeah. <laughs> they're young men and, uh, and overcoming something like that mentally could be a challenge. I do want to say, um, and I'm looking at the Syracuse, um, the, the, the breakdown of scoring this year. And for a team where... You know, we came in this year saying Syracuse's midfield is the best midfield in the country. Um, they have not performed that way. Um, I'm just going to say it flat out. Syracuse top three scorers, Stephen Rafis, Owen Hiltz, Chase Scanlon, the guy who hasn't played in the last two games. Those are their three leading scorers. So um, while the Syracuse defense has probably the most potential out of any team in the country as far as a first midfield um we haven't seen it yet so yeah. unless those guys are going to really step up um i think this could be uh this could be a tough uh situation for them they can get yeah. through it but it'll be tough and their defense is you know still i'm still on the fence about their you know what i'm not even on the fence about yeah, their, i i was going to say here is is average at best yeah, I was just going to say, you're not on the fence about their defense at all. <laughs> you're just on the other side of it right now. <laughs> Jumped over the let, let me ask you this before we go to the next matchup. Is there a possibility that some of this turbulence might rally them together? Because it, there is a, a 
clearly a solid foundation with most of the the guys on that team. You know, we're super grateful that a group of young men, you know, vocally and pretty yes. immediately stood up and said that you know we do not condone um, abuse of women um, and domestic abuse and and whatever else was um, alleged. I don't think anything's been charged yet, or you know, I'm just trying to use proper wording to exactly not, right. anybody. Not that I don't believe that something has happened, um, you know, but it, it that's an incredible thing, and and for a group of uh, young men that age, I think it's really important for them to to have that that team voice. And so, yeah, it could be. You know, what my prediction really is, is Georgetown wins this by a couple goals or Syracuse blows them out. Mm. I'm taking, uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm taking, <laughs> taking either extreme here. Like I said, we are not a hot take pot. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, we're saying someone's going to win. <laughs> One of these teams is going to win. One of these teams is going to win and we don't know. <laughs> That's correct. The next one I think we might know. Um, which is UVA and Bryant. Uh, I can say pretty safely, I think UVA will win this game. Um, I, I can say that pretty safely. I think UVA is a very interesting team because a lot of people forget that they are actually the last team to win a national championship because it was so long ago. Um, so they're an interesting team in that regard. Again, haven't seen Bryant a lot, have seen UVA a lot. Uh, in our 20 person bracket challenge um one person chose bryant with the upset and i think they're playing with house money so <laughs> i will say this coach pressler tra his track record is phenomenal i do think he is going to get the most out of his team to keep it as close as they possibly can if they do you just don't know Bryant traditionally is very good at the X, a very good face-off team. Traditionally, again, this is based on past. Um, pair that with a hot goalie. If that goalie gets hot, then all of a sudden, maybe I'm eating my words and being so quick to say I think UVA wins. But um, I, I feel pretty strongly that the defending champions will get past the first round. Yeah, I think that's a uh I think that that's a safe bet certainly. Um Brian's going to play hard, they're going to play gritty, they're going to have a chip on their shoulder. Um I think what did they a couple of years ago walked into maybe it's more than a couple of years ago walked into Syracuse in the first round and yeah. uh and took down Syracuse in a very unexpected fashion. Um, yeah. So anything can happen. I think one thing that we're going to look at here is that uh top 5 scorers for Virginia are all listed as attackmen. Um, mm. and, uh, you know, the, my, what I told Jordan earlier in the week was that I, I sometimes feel like Virginia has too many good players and, uh, and maybe, you know, guys like Matt Moore, not quite as in the flow or in control, um, as he may have been now, this is a guy who's a second leading scorer on the team. So he's putting up points. Um, but I think that that balance um, hopefully can work to their advantage when it gets down to playoff time, crunch time, when most coaches are shortening their bench, right? So it'll be interesting yeah. to see how Coach Tiffany really utilizes all the talent that he has in service of one goal. Um, and that's you got to win if you want to keep mm -hmm. going. Yeah, yep. Uh, during playoff time, the bench gets shorter. That's for sure. Next matchup. Next. We got the number one team in the country, not in the tournament, but in the country. I still don't understand how all that works. <laughs> the Maryland Terrapins facing off against the Vermont Catamounts. So what's your take on Maryland being uh, number three in general? Thoughts? Three in the tournament, one coming into the last I, week of the season. I think it goes back to what you said about the Big Ten. I think it's kind of that simple. I think it'd be really difficult to not make UNC the number one team yeah. in the tournament. Um, it's also hard. I guess I, I guess I just taught myself why this is the way it is. It's hard to not make Maryland the number one team in the country after the season. 
Um, but when you boil it down and realize how how just obnoxious the ACC is in terms of talent, um, you, you gotta you gotta put an ACC team as number one. You just have to. Um, so I think that's how that works. I'm also again not an expert. This we should just call this the not an expert pod. <laughs> Honestly, not an expert on this, but I think that's how it works. Um, what do you think about Vermont? You actually had a comment about Vermont in our group text. What did I say? About Vermont. Remind me. I, well, I think you said, are we sleeping on Vermont? Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, you know, Chris Fife's coach Fife's a guy that uh, I've known a little bit through the coaching loop and um, just a great human being. Um, and certainly somebody who I could, I could sense is, you know, really getting the most out of his squad. Um, and I think that that's great, but I don't think that getting the most out of that squad is going to put them over the top of Maryland. Um, you know, what, what Vermont has working for them is they had an early season game against Syracuse. So they played somebody that's in the upper stratosphere. Um, I think what they have working against them is you know just looking at their general level of talent while they have four guys that have over 35 points on the season they also have losses to umbc and binghamton um and so you sort of think to yourself if you're capable and maybe this is really messed up to think this way but if you're capable of losing to umbc and binghamton this year um I don't know if uh, if that's happening to some of these other teams that we consider the best teams in the country. So if your talent level or your output level is swinging that far, um, then I think it might be tough for you to put together a consistent effort to get over Maryland unless Maryland sort of stubs their foot a little bit. So, um, you know, certainly happy again to see a team like Vermont who uh, we don't see a lot of in uh, in the tournament, want them to play well, want them to showcase their abilities. Um, looks like they've got a, uh, a couple guys from Toronto um, and uh, a few Canadians here at the top of the list. So it should be a fun team to watch and maybe presents a little matchup uh, difficulty with a team that's maybe used to playing more American style defensively. Um, we know that, that the Canadian guys can lean in, they can be physical, they can shoot from all angles. So, um, that may throw Maryland for a loop here at the very beginning. Maryland has very, very physical defensemen, very physical defensemen. What I'm excited about that, because you bring up that Canadian style of play, the thing that has always mesmerized me about Canadian players, besides their stick skills, which are amazing. I think that's Peter what jumps off. Peterborough hands, right? I think that's Pete, what it's called. That's right. That's right. Peterborough hands. Um, well, up there, I think they say Peterborough, and down by me, they say Peterborough. Um, <laughs> but what jumps off the page is the stick skills, right? The yep. thing that I've always really uh, recognized as something that's a little different is their ability to run through checks. Mm -hmm. they are uh, canadian players just from that that box mentality they can run through stick checks just differently and still be able to get off shots um while taking a check or just running through it so it'll be interesting to see how that kind of collides in this first round um yeah. our our next matchup notre dame and drexel the drex the drex you know what? What I know of Drexel is that they are coming in with a head of steam here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've had, we've certainly had our uh, our mood swings with Notre Dame, um, and I think as uh, as history has proven, um, you know, they haven't been fun to watch. But boy, are they fun to watch right now! Um, to Drexel's coming in with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine wins in a row under their wow. belt. So they got a full head of steam. Um, just coming off of a win over Hofstra last week. Um, Hofstra's got some offensive talent. So um, again, look for a team who probably puts up a uh, puts up a really good fight, you know, in the first half. Um, 
you know, I think that um, it'll be interesting. Notre Dame plays with a lot of swag. And mm. if Drexel can come in with that, that Brian Volker, that, that uh, Philly mentality and really wants to mix it up right away, um, I will be interested to see um, how Notre Dame plays. You know, I think they're structured defense. I think they have a bit of a swaggy offense, but uh, I'm interested to see what would happen if somebody would punch them in the mouth right, right across the, uh, the uh, first face off there. Yeah, that's, uh, that will be fun to see. I, we have in our bracket challenge of 20 people, 18 people have Notre Dame winning and two people have <laughs> Drexel winning. So yeah, I, listen, I am excited to see Drexel play period. I haven't gotten a chance to see him play. Um, I've always uh, kind of liked their style in the past and I still think Notre Dame probably has a significant advantage, but I'm excited to watch the game. I, I don't think it's going to be 10 in a row for Drexel though. I hate to say that. Ye of little faith. Let's talk about Denver. Denver Wait, and Loyola. But before we do, do you think Drexel's going to win 10 in a row? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. So you, just because but you I said, be, uh. But I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. I'll take that. But just because you said, uh, you have more faith than I do. Yeah, I have a little bit more faith. All right. That's fair. Uh, Denver, Loyola, another highly, highly debated um, game in our bracket challenge. Right now, this is probably the one between Georgetown and Syracuse, Denver and Loyola. That is the most 50-50 picked. Um, and to me, one of the most interesting because you have Denver coming off of uh, losing in their conference tournament. Yep. Mm -hmm. And Loyola coming off of forfeiting their conference tournament. <laughs> um, yeah, this one's a, this one was a toss up for me. I think I went Same. with uh, did I go with Denver? I went with Denver. I think you um, did. yeah. You know, I went with Denver because I just felt like Denver has had um, they've been a little bit more battle tested. I use that term a lot, but I actually believe in it. You know, I believe when you've stood toe to toe with some real big challenges, you never lose that experience. Um, you know, they had, they went on that early season trip to North Carolina and came back empty handed. Um, but I think you have to play those games. You know, they're playing those games the first week of February coming off of, you know, all this COVID year craziness. And so, uh, I think those games are are somewhat different. I don't think they win both of them, but I think they're somewhat different if they play them later on in the season. Um, you know, they played Georgetown 16 times this year. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they're just excited to play somebody that wears something other than blue and silver. So they'll trade it for green and silver here. Um, right. You know, it, it's Coach Tierney. How can you choose against Coach Tierney who just, you know, he's been such a, a stable a consistent person in uh, the playoffs. Not that Charlie Toomey and the and the Loyola Greyhounds haven't been lately, but uh, I feel like Coach T is going to have those guys tuned up and ready to go. And um, and I think that Denver's seen a little bit more than what the Patriot League has to offer. Um, and I think they can rise to a higher level. Uh, typically, you and I agree on most everything, but I'm going to quote Lee Corso and say, "Not so fast, my friend." Oh. Are you putting on the Greyhound head right now? <laughs> if I had one, I might be putting it on. Now, I'm by no, I want to make it very clear. In no way, shape, or form does this mean that we are necessarily rooting for certain teams. We're no. rooting for great games. We are. And, and with all of the great connections that we've been able to make in the game, we know somebody or know somebody that knows somebody that's connected to most of these schools, right? So I'm not rooting for Loyola over denver but here's why i picked villa in their last four games they're four and oh and of those four i think they're the last three at the very least were really big time quality wins and avenging wins over teams that they again had played like two or three times already um so when i'm looking at quality wins i do think those end of your Patriot League wins were pretty strong. One of those non-Patriot League wins was against Georgetown, who we know is, as we said, dangerous. So I chose Loyola because one, I think they're angry 
that they did not get to try and win their conference tournament. Two, I think they came out hot in those last few weeks of the season. I want to make sure that everybody still realizes that one of the best offensive coaches of all time, I will say that, and Coach Mark Van Arsdale is still coaching at Loyola. So True. you got a big time uh, just coaching matchup, big time matchup in general. It's going to be a fun one. So I'm really excited about that. The only thing that I'm a little nervous about since I did pick Loyola in my bracket challenge, it is in uh, Colorado. So it is at Denver. So that does play a factor for sure. Um, but you know, players play wherever they're supposed to. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and stick with that. There you go. Okay. I'm happy you said it. I'm happy you said it. That's good insight. Thank you. I appreciate that. Last matchup. Last Ooh. matchup. Can just we just all, say. How, how many people in our bracket <laughs> goes high point over Duke? Can I can I first say that when I say this, I feel like um, like I'm hosting Family Feud. Like out of twenty participants, uh, two <laughs> survey so set in our bracket in our bracket challenge of twenty people. One person chose High Point to upset Duke. One that one person is on this podcast right now, and it is not me. So that narrows it down to the big guy. Why did you choose High Point to upset the team that has Michael Sowers, that has JT Giles Harris, that has Coach Janowski? Why did you pick them? I just want everybody to know I have two thumbs and I chose <laughs> <laughs> High Point to win this game. <laughs> All right. Here's the logic on this. High Point has been knocking at the door for a while now. Let's look at their history here. They've got 17 to 15 loss to North Carolina, 27 to 12 loss to North Carolina. There's like a week in between those two losses. 12 to 11 loss to Virginia, 27 to 8 loss to Duke. Finished off winning that SoCon conference, beating Richmond. What I see in High Point is highs and lows. I think when, because they're down in North Carolina and games were regional this year, they had a chance to really go toe to toe with some really great teams. Um, they've fared pretty well. They've gotten worked by those teams, but I think that experience is super valuable. Um, I think that they've got plenty of film and plenty of experience and uh, as far as knowing what Duke has and knowing what Duke does, yada, yada, yada. And I think they've got some guys that can do some stuff too. And I just wanted to give them a little bit more energy. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted somebody to know. I wanted Coach Torpy to know that, you know what, man? I think that you're going to win this game. I think that Duke has to play not so Duke. And I think the high point has to play really high point, but I think that it's possible. I think that it's possible. And this is coming from the guy at the beginning, the first show of the year when we were talking about college lacrosse, I said, I picked Duke, right? You remember in that snake draft? Yes. I said, nothing scarier than a Duke team that has won all of their games at the beginning of the season. I did uh, say that. I don't know that I've seen the same consistent level out of Duke game after game that I would have liked to see after that start to the season. So I'm thinking that maybe there's a couple heads to that monster and, uh, and I'm giving high point a shot. Okay. So Asher Knowlton. So there's that. Uh, I, that's probably the best point you made in that whole rant was Asher Knowlton. Um, that, yeah. So Kevin that's Rogers. A, do you know Kevin Rogers? So that's that's what I was going to say before we even jumped out of high point real <laughs> quick. Kevin Rogers, shout out to that man. Uh, he transferred from the University of Lynchburg. Um, I never I saw him play at Lynchburg, but I have a hard time imagining that young man playing Division Three lacrosse. Like, he yeah. just hammers the ball. Well, 
I have seen him play. Uh, I did see him play at Lynchburg, and it looked a lot like how he plays at High Point. Uh, <laughs> so I'm I'm happy to for him. I, I've never met him personally, but um, by all accounts, from all of my uh, my friends down at, at the University of Lynchburg, he's a he's a wonderful kid. So good for him and good for High Point, and awesome for Coach Torpy, who I've also heard is just a great great guy. Um, and that's pretty much where I'm going to stop talking about high point because I'm going to get into the team they're playing since we're doing a history lesson. Let's talk about their history this season. They have two losses by a total of eight goals to North Carolina and Notre Dame. Yeah. And where, where I agree, you're right. The consistency, maybe not as uh, well as consistent as <laughs> we would have liked to see from a team going into the tournament but let's keep in mind it's still only two losses in a very weird and and seemingly long season um for them specifically they play in the toughest conference in the country there's no debating it um at the end of the day they have big time playmakers big time playmakers if they happen to be clicking on all cylinders that day I think it's a tough task for High Point. Hear me out on this and feel free to turn me down. Not that I need to give you permission. Do you think any of these ACC teams are tired after beating up mm. on each other all season? Some maybe we, not physically tired, maybe mentally tired. Well, it's something we've said, right, about uh, the NESCAC in Division Three. When the NESCAC is in full swing, not their abbreviated season like this year, they really just beat up on each other during that conference tournament, um, which gives whoever they're playing next a, a real shot um, in the NCAA tournament. I don't know if that's the case for this one. I don't think so. Um, I think that really falls more into the category of what you were talking about, about being battle tested. Yeah. Because really all those teams that were beating up on each other, they're all in the NCAA tournament, all four yeah. of them. Question for you, Coach. Who is the one non-ACC team that has the best opportunity to make it to the Final Four? That is a really good question. Best non-ACC team? Well, I, I got to say Maryland. I do. I, I think that's kind of an easy pick, or it's the, the easy pick. Um <laughs> It's got to be them. I mean, they have arguably, you know, a Tourton chaser in Bernhardt. And they, ha like I said, physical, tough, hard-nosed defense. They are one of my friends the other day. We were talking about the tournament. And, and he said, Maryland's so well coached that even when they're not that good, they look that good. <laughs> and I, I agree. I agree. And we've said this before. We've been kind of moody with Maryland as well, based on past experiences. Um, but they have turned into something really fun to watch. They have Bobby Benson as their offensive coordinator. Oh, right. um, When's he going to get a head job? Come on now. Yeah. Somebody hooked this guy up already. But uh, I mean, Maryland's probably pretty excited to have him right now. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Coach Tillman is. He's just so methodical and so detail oriented and um, he's going to find ways to win games. And, um, you know, they're my easy choice to, to be a final four team. That's not an ACC team. I think it's really possible. I find it hard to believe that one of the two Maryland or Notre Dame is not going to be in the final four. Right. Like, that's crazy. That's yeah. crazy. Like quarterfinals are going to be, off the chain leet leet <laughs> like <laughs> off the chain um i i just like that it, there's something i mean i tell me if i'm wrong like that's weird that's unsettling that there one of them is gonna get knocked out before the final four and they probably both deserve to be there agreed you could make a case that you know I, I allowed a, uh, I, I enrolled a bunch of our middle scores in filling out brackets today and over half of them picked Maryland's to win the national championship. So and it's not a bad pick. 
no. it's not a bad pick. I I'll I will tell you in our 20 person bracket challenge, we have three people that picked Maryland, and I think that's low. I do. I I I'm surprised it's only three. We have uh one, two, three people that picked Notre Dame, and I think that's low. You know, that's I think this is so wide open and that's, what's going to make it so great. A lot of people feeling UNC right now. I got you. A UN- lot of people, a lot of people, UNC Georgetown, Notre Dame, high point. Oh, oh. Anthony you, this kid, this kid. Remember what I said about the hot takes? Maybe we are a hot take pot all of a sudden. <laughs> Those are, that's a high final four. Uh, my final four is a little more, I think a little more run of the mill. I have UNC, UVA, Notre Dame, and Duke. I had a really hard time with the Notre Dame Maryland game. Um, I ended up going with Notre Dame just because we've been hyping them up so much on the pod, and that's where I stood for that one. So, okay. whatever it is, I think everyone's going to enjoy it. I know we'll be watching. We know you'll be watching. Maybe we'll talk about it again next week. I'm sure we will. Uh, and listen, it's a great time of the year. It's a great time of the year if you're a lacrosse fan. And don't sleep on those D3 games. Get your, get your internet fixed. Watch, <laughs> those, watch those streams because those are going to be some great games as well. And uh, honestly, to, to be truly honest, we talked about maybe doing some, some D3 talk but there are so many teams and I don't think we could have done it justice. Um, and, uh, but I'll be tuning into those D three games just as intently as I, as I am with, uh, with D one games. There it is. So let it be written. See Enjoy the week. this weekend coach. Enjoy the you games. Too. You too. I, I'm looking forward to it. I'm, we probably won't talk during them. Like we do all the other games, right? <laughs> probably not even a little bit. Maybe a little bit. All right.